good everybody see or can someone let me know yep you're good to go okay so i tweaked the title a little bit um i'd gone through and looked at a few of the past speakers and i saw there was a lot of urban stuff and scott had mentioned that he was or to focus on ag stuff so i i'm not going to talk really about any of the urban urban things um i'm going to talk more about kind of a natural history and then agricultural land use within the within the watershed and uh if we uh we're all aware of the size of the watershed uh two states eight counties um about 800,000 acres i'll come back to this later but about 28 29 percent of the watershed has hydric soils or things that potentially could have been um, actually defined as wetlands that uh, most of those are gone now because of agricultural drainage so let's uh, take a step back and you know why why is the watershed where it is what what shapes it what causes the divides to be there so if we if we take a step back and look uh, the main watershed divides in north america obviously are the rocky mountains we got the appalachians and the adirondacks but if you look between uh between uh, McHenry County, DeKalb County, and the city of Chicago, there's another continental scale watershed divide. And uh, last time I went to the city was a couple of days ago, and I don't recall driving over any mountains, but uh, there are some glacial features there that are really important to delineating these, these watersheds. So if we come in to um, look at Illinois, we've got three major watersheds, the Mississippi, the Ohio, and the Great Lakes. The Mississippi and the Ohio come together down at Cairo. Uh, the uh, extreme northeastern part of uh, of the state, a little bit of Will, Eastern Cook and Eastern Lake, drain into the Great Lakes, and that continental scale drainage divide that's right there is a, a glacial feature called a, a moraine that I'll talk about how they form later. Uh, different moraines form the bound the uh, watershed divides on about half of of the of the Kish. So let's let's first start with the geology of the area. Um, the uh, the the uh, the state's been cut into what we call physio physiographic regions or zones that have similar geology, land use, um, soils, and uh, the the Kish watershed falls in four of those. The Rock River Hill Country we'll get to in a few minutes. That's the uh, older Illinois episode glaciation. The Wheaton Morainal and the Bloomington Ridged Plain, the brown and the green on here, those are both parts of the last area of glaciation called the Wisconsin episode. Uh, they differ in topography quite a bit, though. The green area is much flatter than the the brown area, relatively. And then we've got a little piece of what's called the Green River Lowland, and that's where the glacial meltwater um, from the last glaciation, a lot of it went towards the Mississippi. So we'll come back and we'll look at those specific sediments and how they got there and when they got there in a few minutes. Um, if we start at the bottom, we go to the, the bedrock. Um, oh, and I, I have to apologize. I guess nobody's from Wisconsin here. Uh, my uh, Wisconsin is going to be white in most of these because uh, most of the ARC info I have that I've been using for the last couple of decades, I have all the Illinois databases and not all the Wisconsin stuff. So apologies to the Badger State. You're going to be left out of some of these. Um, so the, the bedrock that's uh, down there is uh, mostly Silurian and Ordovician. Uh, these are 400 million year old or more um, marine rocks, mostly limestones and dolostones, a few shale and sandstone units in there. Um, so we've got the, the bedrock down underneath the glacial sediments that are on top. And we'll come back and we'll look at how water moves or does not move through these units in a, in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, there are numerous uh, bedrock valleys in Illinois. Uh, this is just an FYI, but uh, up until about 18,000 years ago, the Mississippi River um, went through central Illinois. So the red dot is where the Mississippi River used to be. The ancestral Iowa River came in this way. Uh, the Taze Mohammed came in from West Virginia across Ohio and Indiana and met up with the the um, ancestral Mississippi here in central Illinois, but we've got two tributaries in our in the Kish watershed, the Rock and the Troy. These are buried bedrock valleys that are uh, really important aquifers that I'll, I'll show you kind of how they formed and why they're there uh, in, a, in a second. So the Troy is farther east, the Rock is a little bit farther on the western edge. If we look at the thickness of glacial sediments that are on top of the bedrock, uh, I want to just point out these areas in orange and red here. 
Uh, these are the buried bedrock valleys that have been filled with, with glacial sediments. There's 300, 400, to more than 500 feet of sediments. The, the thickest are down here uh, southwest of the Kish a few miles, but there's some areas in the Kish that have about 300 to 400 feet of, of glacial sediments in some of those buried bedrock valleys. So if we go back to before glaciation, um, go back a few tens of millions of years, uh, the uh, again, the Mississippi came in this direction, the Taze Mohammed came across and went this direction towards the Mississippi. We've got the rock and the Paw uh, and the Troy, sorry, that meet up in, at the Paw Paw Valley. Um, Illinois looks like Kentucky. It's a bedrock landscape that's highly dissected by by river systems. Um, then we get covered by ice. And again, let's take a look at the why these areas are so thick um, in the Troy and the Rock and then the Paw Paw Valley down here. There, there's two things that contribute to this. Uh, the the downcutting of the rivers that form this valley. And then in a second, I'm going to talk about moraines. And these are landforms that are constructed by glaciation that can often be ridges. And it just happens to be a coincidence that where these buried valleys are right in this zone down here in the southwestern part of the watershed, there happens to be a moraine sitting on top of that, which is going to give us these extremely thick uh, zones of set of glacial sediment. So uh, moraines form, and I'll show you a, a diagram in a second, but they form when the ice advance equals the ice melt. And what that does is it, it allows sediment to accumulate at the margin of the glacier. So if the, mar if the glacier is advancing, we're not going to form a ridge. But if that glacier advances 100 feet a year, but melts 100 feet of ice a year, the ice is still moving, but it's going to appear to be stationary and we're going to pile up sediment. So these green zones on here are what we call moraines or these ridges. So the, this is the, the big moraine that separates the Great Lakes watershed going this direction from the Mississippi going this direction. The city of Chicago, most of you are aware, cut a canal through here um, to reverse the flow of the Chicago River. They cut it through that that watershed divide or that moraine. But let's come back to here. We've got a moraine sitting right on top of a buried valley. So what that's going to do is the buried valley is going to give us a thick amount of sediments. But then if we have a moraine or this ridge that was built right on top of it, we're going to get extremely thick uh, deposits. So let's take a look at what's in these in these valleys. Let me back up. So in some of the buried bedrock valleys, we have this material called outwash, and that's uh, glacial meltwater. It's mostly sand and gravel. It's a really good aquifer material. In some of the buried valleys, we have till, which is a really dense material that doesn't let water move through it. Now, the actual stratigraphy is more complicated than this. Uh, there's, there's alternating layers of outwash and tills and in places. But uh, the big picture, some of the valleys are full of outwash in some parts, some are full of till. So the ones that where we see orange on here, these are aquifer materials. The green and the purple are aquitards. We can't get groundwater out of those. So many of you, I'm sure, were part of this movement. But the uh, Kishwaukee Valley Water Authority that was uh, attempted to get established uh, in part was due to the, the water that's found in these, in these uh, bedrock valleys and the potential of it being exploited and moved uh, out of the watershed to to a more urban areas to the east. So most of you I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking to were, were part of this um, this movement. So let's take a step back. Illinois has been glaciated multiple times during the, the last two and a half million years or what we call the Quaternary. So the Kish watershed, most recently the eastern half and the southern half of it were covered by what's known as the Wisconsin episode glaciation. That ice was here about 20 to 15,000 years ago. Prior to that, ice covered almost all of Illinois during what we call the Illinois episode, and that was about 130,000 years ago. So ice advances to the light green here, melts back, is gone for about 100,000 years, and then readvances to the darker green location here. So the till, this is the sediment that the ice actually deposits. Uh, it's tens to hundreds of feet thick. Uh, it's pretty continuous and extensive across Illinois and especially the water, the Kish watershed. Uh, very low permeability. We can't get groundwater out of it. Now, when the ice melts in the summer, we get material called outwash. And these are meltwater streams that have sand and gravel in them. 
these make excellent aquifer materials. Uh, the problem is they're easily contaminated if they're shallow or, or close to the surface. So urban and agricultural activities can, can introduce contaminants that can move through this stuff rapidly. Now, um, when we have uh, glaciation and deglaciation happening, we get what are called braided stream systems. The stream is not competent or able to remove all the sediment, so we, what we get what's called bed load. There's sand and gravel that's being moved, and it starts to accumulate and, and build up out in front of the ice. So we get these braided streams. You can see there's hundreds of channels here. Um, the Mississippi would have been much wider than this, but the Kishwaukee would have been narrower than this. But this is what all of the Midwestern rivers that were connected to the ice sheet looked like during during glaciation and deglaciation. So the till is being smeared down underneath the ice. So the till is only located where the glacier actually advanced. The outwash, the meltwater, can be found well beyond the margin uh, of the ice sheet to where that drainage water is moving. So we can get the sands and gravels deposited much farther out than the ice actually advanced. And then when the ice melts back here, we can get outwash deposited in these in these areas. There, there are other sediments we're not going to cover related to glaciation, but what I want you to, to kind of visualize is in mountainous regions in alpine glaciation, we have what are called valley trains. So let's say we have the glaciers back here melting. We've got a river valley that exists already in front of the ice. So that meltwater is trapped in that valley. Well, if we come back to Illinois, a couple of million years ago, we have these buried bedrock valleys. So when the ice advances, the meltwater is going to go down the Troy into the Pawpaw, into the ancestral Mississippi. And we're going to fill some of these buried bedrock valleys, we're going to fill with outwash. Now, not all of them fill with outwash, but we're going to fill a bunch of them with, with outwash, sand and gravel. Okay, the, the Illinois episode glacier makes reaches the maximum extent down at about uh, Carbondale. The ice melts back. And then this process gets repeated 18,000 years ago when the Wisconsin episode ice readvances into the state, except all these buried, all these valleys are buried when the, when the most recent glacier advances into the state. So we can't see these valleys anymore from the surface. They're full of sediment. So if we kind of visualize, if we go back to the Ordovician and the Silurian, the 400 million year old carbonate rocks that we have around here, they were deposited in a shallow marine environment when Illinois and North America, our part of North America was, was near the equator. Um, the North American plate has migrated north uh, to where we're currently located. Um, hundreds of millions of years ago by, and then let's get to, uh, again, the formation of these valleys by rivers that have downcut and eroded through the limestones and dolostones. And then the Illinois episode ice comes in, and as the ice comes in, it's gonna fill some of these with the meltwater in the valley train. It's gonna fill some of them with till. So the ones that are full of outwash in orange, again, these are potential aquifers. So the city of DeKalb has some several wells drilled in, in, the, in the Troy. Uh, they're blending it with, with deeper groundwater to pull the radium uh, content down. So then the, the Wisconsin episode adva uh, ice advances, and again, we have the, the green is the young till, the purple is the old till. Um, those are not aquifer materials. We can't get groundwater out of those. And then the last thing that happens, I'll, I'll go over in a second, is the, this material called lust gets deposited. It's windblown silt, and it blankets the, the surface of most of the state and the, most of the watershed. Now, again, uh, if we're going to withdraw groundwater, we're going to be looking at the bedrock that's highly fractured and karstified limestones and dolostones. It's really permeable. And then these valleys that are full of outwash. Um, and again, part of the idea between the, the water authority was to protect um, the water that was and regulate the withdrawals of water that was in some of these buried bedrock valleys. So if we look at the, the till, uh, again, it's an aquitard. Water moves through it extremely slowly. We can't extract it in usable quantities. Uh, the outwash and the limestones and dolostones and then the older underlying sandstones make great aquifer materials. All right, so let's let's look at the, the, the uh, quaternary or the glacial geology in the area. Um, the most recent glaciation stopped. Uh, along the red dot that's moving down through here. So the end moraine of the last glaciation is right here. The western part of the watershed is older sediments. 
the Illinois episode, the pinkish material is actually underneath the green, uh, unless it had been eroded away. So if we were to drill through the green areas, in theory, the pink, uh, the older till should be underneath of it, and then the bedrock underneath that. Now, it was eroded away in some places, and it's, it's not present everywhere. So we have two different ages of glaciation. Uh, we have two different ages of outwash, the meltwater that's, that's in the area. Uh, the moraines, again, the ridges of till that were formed are shown on the right here in the, in the green. They would be dark green on the drawing to the left. They don't show up quite as well. Um, now, what's going to be important about these moraines is many of them are watershed divides. So if we look at the southern end of the, of the, of the Kish uh, watershed, the, the Bloomington and the Shabana moraines and the Elburn complex make up uh, the, the watershed divides, the high points. And then you can follow some of these moraines up here, the Bloomington, um, and many of those uh, moraines make up the watershed divides. Now, out in the older uh, till, there are moraines that are unnamed, uh, and they're probably what is what is making the the divides out out to the western. So, same features but older uh, in age. So, how does a moraine form? Okay, when the ice advances at the same rate that it melts, it's going to pile sediment up at the margin. We might have outwash out in front. The meltwater could be coming out here. Um, if the ice melts faster than it advances, so if it's going, if it's melting, I'm sorry, if it's advancing 20 feet per year, but we're melting 40 feet of ice per year, the ice margin is going to move slowly backwards, even though the ice is still moving forward from Canada. And we're going to deposit what's called ground moraine. This is just an area of till that's flatter. Uh, and then the recessional moraines form the same as the terminal moraine advance is going to equal melt and the ice will be here for several hundred years and it's going to construct this ridge of till um, ice is going to melt faster than it advances again we're going to get another ground moraine there might be lake sediments here there could be a lake here there could be a lake here i could have drawn outwash potentially here or outwash here um, but we get locations that had lakes and we get locations that had outwash beyond the ice margins so the moraines uh, in Illinois, many of them are three, four, five, six miles wide, and they have multiple crests to them. It's not one nice bump. It's three or four or five or six uh, crests where the ice oscillated back and forth, melted back faster, oscillated, or melt equals advance, formed another moraine, melted faster than it advanced, then melt equals advance again, form another moraine. So again, many of these are the watershed divides uh, in, in the glaciated part of the country. Now, these things don't look like the Rocky Mountains. Here's the here's a moraine uh, between Elburn and St. Charles, um, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet higher than the surrounding landscape. Uh, often, you'll see cell phone towers. You'll see uh, uh, water towers, you'll see uh, wind turbines on the on the tops of these moraines quite often. The last sediment that got deposited that I want to talk about that's really important because it's what led to the agricultural productivity is a material called LUS. It's a German word. It refers to windblown silt. And it turns out silt has the perfect silt is the perfect material to grow to grow plants in. Um, so it's the surficial material in most of the watershed and, and in fact most of the midwest and if we look at where the lust distribution is and if we look at the corn and soybean production well let's just say corn in this one um, it's not a coincidence that there's a major overlap between that because the stuff called lust again has perfect properties to to grow plants in so if we look at the lust thickness map the red is more than 300 inches the green is about 25 inches, the light green, and then the yellow, there's no less present. So if we look at the majority of the Kish watershed up here, we're on the order of 25 to about 75 inches of lust, two, three, four feet, depending on where you're at. The lust is thicker to the west, it thins to the east, and that's because the lust blew out of the major river valleys during deglaciation. So we've got Mississippi River Valley here has outwash flowing down through it. And there's silt in that outwash that eventually is going to get picked up by the wind and blown regionally across uh, across the 
Illinois and Indiana and Wisconsin. So some of this loss that was deposited in the Kishwaukee watershed came from the the Illinois uh, the Mississippi River Valley. Some of it came from farther west in river valleys like the Wapsipinicon or the Cedar uh, that were out in Iowa that dust blew regionally across the the Midwest. So here's the Illinois River Valley today. You can see the silt accumulations that are downwind. But let's go back and again picture what all these Midwestern rivers were like. The Kish looked like this. The Illinois looked like this. The Mississippi looked like this. Now in the in the summer we've got these braided streams and it's wet out here. Uh, no sediment is going to be blown out of here by the wind. But in the winter the melting glacier is going to slow is going to uh, basically stop melting and these braided rivers are going to dry out. And what's going to happen is the wind is going to blow across here. There's no vegetation to protect from erosion. The sand grains are going to saltate or bounce two or three inches off the ground. They're going to knock a silt particle, which is smaller, up into the air. And that silt is going to get blown downwind, which happens to be eastward based on the paleo wind direction uh, 15,000 years ago. So this is what many afternoons would have looked like during deglaciation in the winter and, and early spring um, before those braided rivers again filled up with water. So you can see there's dust blowing through the air and in places we're gonna get thick accumulations of that loss close to the major rivers. The farther away we get, the thinner it's gonna get. Um, so you can notice the loss here, it's, it's, it lacks sand. You don't see gravel in it. Uh, like you do in the till that's uh, that's underneath of it. So this would be the thinner, the eastern edge of the Kish watershed would have loss about this thick. The western half of the watershed has loss that's two or three or four feet in thickness. And this is the stuff that's perfect for growing plants. So let's get to the soils and the vegetation part. Um, if we look at the early land surveyors that came through in the early 1800s, they took incredible notes when they laid out the uh, township and range uh, grid, they took notes, and the Illinois Natural History Survey has digitized those notes. And uh, for the Kish watershed, it was about 67% prairie, 27% um, forest. I lumped all the wetland things they put together. I just put them all in blue. Uh, a whole bunch of that prairie was, was wet prairie, though they way underestimated uh, that. So this wasn't a botanical survey, it was a land surveyors. So you can see though about two-thirds of the watershed was was prairie and about a third of it was, or a fourth of it was was forested. Now the, the, all these wetland types, they could be prairie, they could be forested, um, but they're the wettest of the wet areas. Current land use, as everybody is aware of, corn, soybeans, um, some urban areas and then uh, some natural areas, a few remnants left, a few nature preserves uh, that have been then captured. So we went from uh, prairie grass and nitrogen fixing legumes to corn and soybeans today. The soil orders that are there for those that have heard of these words before, mollusols, have the thick dark a horizons or topsoil these are the most productive soils on the planet uh, they are the ones that are form under prairie where you have lots of roots decomposing in the ground to give you an organic accumulation of organic matter over time uh, the forested soils we call alpha sols they have much thinner topsoil or what we call an a horizon they're not nearly as productive so you can see the the northern part of the watershed uh, has a higher percentage of, of forested soils than the the southern southern half of the watershed, mostly prairie in the central central part of it, and that that map lines up pretty well with the native vegetation um, map because the type of vegetation you have is going to ultimately over thousands of years impact the type of soils you end up with. Okay, one of the key things we deal with in in the watershed is is water. Too much water, uh, many parts of the year, especially in agriculture and engineering activities. So the USDA has this drainage classification scheme that goes from excessively down to very poorly. And these are agriculturally biased. Um, if you're a wetland plant, poorly and very poorly are good and well-drained is not so well for you. So this is, this is biased towards corn production and, and building houses. Um, we can see that there's a lot of blue and green on here. The, the, the three colors of blue are typically soils that are tile drained. 
So you can see the southern two-thirds of the watershed has a, a lot of soils that potentially are extremely wet. Uh, hydric soils, um, they make up 20, I didn't, again, I didn't have the data for the Wisconsin side, I didn't download it, but 28% of the Illinois portion were hydric soils. Those are the wettest of the wet, and almost all of those have been drained. There's a few acres that haven't, but most of them, most of them have. You can see there's a lot more of those in the recently glaciated area versus the older glaciation. Uh, land capability class is something the U.S. Department of Agriculture uses. Uh, one would be the best for crop production. Eight would be the worst. Uh, so one and two are really the optimum, the best soils. And you can see most of the watershed are uh, class one or class two soils. The, the class five are ones that are typically in floodplains uh, or they're on very steep sloping areas that uh, aren't, as, aren't as productive. If we look at the USDA's definition of prime farmland, most of the watershed is is prime farmland. Some of it has is prime with modifications, and those are typically the soils that require tile drainage. So unless they're drained, they're not prime for agricultural product production. But most of them have been tile drained, and we'll get to the tile drainage part here in a second. All right, so that's what's there. Let's look at uh, what we've done done with it. So again, the water table is a huge issue in this part of the world. Um, it's going to cause a decline in yields. It's going to impact the timing of farming operations. Obviously, it's going to impact water in basements. It's going to impact uh, road bearing capacity, foundation capa uh, bearing capacity, things like that. We're going to focus on the ag, the ag part here. So uh, during significant parts of the year, especially the spring, the water table is at or near the surface in many of our soils. So the water table uh, is defined. It's the top of the saturated zone. And it can fluctuate several feet up and down throughout the course of a year. So in the spring, when we have more precipitation and less evapotranspiration, water tables typically closer to the surface. In the fall, uh, after we've had a summer of high evapotranspiration and less precipitation, the water table will drop. So it's, it's dynamic. Um, and it's close enough to the surface in most of Illinois and the Kish watershed that we have to deal with this if we're going to grow agricultural plants. So uh, we have what are called drainage systems, drainage tile that are put in. There are surface systems and subsurface systems. Uh, the surface drainage typically is more grading and manipulation of the land surface to remove water before it can infiltrate. We're not going to focus on that. We don't do that much of it around here. We're going to focus on the subsurface drainage. Now, the reason we tile drained all this land was for several reasons. We can get in the field and plant earlier. That increases the period of photosynthesis in the growing season. So if I can plant April 20th, I have more sunlight than if I can plant May 20th. So I have a longer growing season, potentially higher yields. Uh, wet soils are more likely to compact. Um, we can get increased yields if we have a thicker oxygen-rich zone. Corn has not evolved in saturated soils, so we don't want the uh, pore space to be full of water. Um, there's obviously a million engineering reasons why we would, would want to do this. Uh, we also get warmer soil temperatures. Uh, the specific heat of water is one gram per calorie or one, one calorie per gram degree Celsius. So it takes one calorie of energy to heat one gram of water, one degree Celsius. Dry soil has a specific heat of about 0 0.2. So what that means is it takes five times the energy to heat up water than it does dry soil. So if our soils are dry earlier in the spring, they're going to warm up faster, and that's going to give us more vigorous uh, germination uh, of seeds and uh, better... Uh, growth of, of, of seedlings and less disease problems. Now, there's all kinds of negatives and, and all of these slides are simplifications. I could, I could do an hour on each one of these slides, uh, but some of the drawbacks of these drainage systems are we lost wetlands and habitat and biodiversity. We lost uh, a lot of organic carbon. Um, some other time, maybe I could talk about the, the impact of, of drainage on soil carbon and soil quality. Um, but our soils are not as productive now as they were 100 years ago um, because we've lost organic matter because we lowered the water table. We created aerobic conditions that used to be anaerobic. Um, most of you are familiar with the urban hydrograph where we remove water rapidly from urban areas. It has a short lag time. It gets to the river rapidly. 
uh, as opposed to moving through the soil as base flow into the, the river days or weeks later. Uh, well, by putting this tile drainage in, we've created something similar, but not as, as, as significant as the urban hydrograph. Uh, most of the surficial soils in the watershed had, uh, have about a 50% pore space. So that means in one foot of water, one foot of soil, you could store six inches of water. Now we've removed that and these tile are about three feet deep. So in three feet of soil, we've removed one and a half feet of water. Uh, slowly as the tile removed those. So um, I could elaborate more on that, but I didn't put a bunch of that in the, put any of that in this presentation because I want to focus on the, the contaminant movement, the, the nitrogen part. Um, nitrogen is, is the big, the number one nutrient we add to grass plants. Corn is a grass, wheat is a grass, Kentucky bluegrass and your lawn is a grass. Golf courses use a lot of nitrogen. Um, so we're going to lose some nitrogen because of these soil drainage systems. And if we think about where do the drainage systems go, the drainage tile, well, they're hooked up into the rivers and in our watershed, it's all going to end up in the Gulf of Mexico. So we're going to follow what happens to nitrogen applied or uh, corn applied, nitrogen applied to corn in the Kish. Where does it end up? Okay. So here again are the drainage classes uh, as defined by the USDA. Uh, to make a determination, there are soil properties we look at that I'm not going to elaborate on, but it's based on how thick and dark the A is and where the reduction occurs in the soil. Um, what depth does it occur at? So the, the three classes of soil that typically are tile drained are the somewhat poorly, poorly, and very poorly. Um, in corn production, it's usually not economical to tile the well and moderately well-drained soil because the water table is not close enough to the surface long enough to, to impact yields and, and getting out in the field. But in the lower parts and the wetter parts of the landscape, it, uh, they're typically tiled. So if we look at what those soils look like, Catlin, Flanagan, uh, El Paso, or Drummer are three very common soils in the, in the watershed. Uh, as you get wetter, you'll notice the A horizon or the top soil gets thicker and darker, and you start to see more gray or evidence of iron reduction underneath underneath that. So in a spring, the uh, in an untiled situation, this El Paso or drummer soil would have water at the surface, might even be ponded. The Flanagan might have water up into the topsoil and the Catlin, the water table is only going to make it up into here. So uh, with corn and soybean production, it's not economical to tie all these moderately well-drained soils. The water table just doesn't get close enough to the surface often enough. But it is economical to tile the uh, the lower soils. Now, for urban uses, the the how the tiling around the foundation is cheap compared to uh, the value of the house. So we're going to tile around uh, houses, even if they're in well-drained soils, because the water table still could be three, four feet from the from the surface. All right. If we look at a, a map of the the country with or the lower 48 anyway, with drainage classes, uh, the bluer the wetter. And I just want you to notice Illinois and the glaciated Midwest, uh, along with the coastal plain and the, the Delta and the Mississippi River Valley um, are the wettest areas. If, if you live in these green areas, you don't even talk about drainage tile. You, your problem is not enough water, uh, not too much water during part of the year. And if we come in and look at the, the Kish, um, again, the very poorly, poorly and somewhat poorly are almost all tile drained. So the bottom two thirds of the watershed uh, have more tile drainage than the northern third, especially the western, the western area over here that's more rolling. Um, so there's a lot of drainage tile. Uh, if we were to go back and look by the late 1800s, uh, a lot of these drainage tile had already been put in uh, by 1930. Uh, so you can see the geologically different parts of the Kish here. The Wisconsin episode glaciation down here has a lot more tile and a lot more wet soils than the Illinois episode glaciation area does up here. So there's more tile and poorly drained soils in the lower part of the watershed. But Illinois, we're number one for, for tile drainage. So these things are everywhere. Um, anybody that does any activity out on the land has run into a drainage tile for either urban use or uh, agricultural use. All right, so how do these tile work? When, how did they start to put them in? Well, one thing you could do is you could dig a ditch. 
and that ditch could be graded towards some outlet. The water will flow into the ditch and away, except these are hard to farm over. So we do have ditches that are along field edges. We have some streams or creeks that were straightened that are now ditches. Um, but a better way to do this is to dig a trench, put a pipe in it with holes in it, and then backfill over it, and then we can farm over the top of this. And we don't know it's there. And the idea is we're going to lower the water table from close to the surface of the spring to some some lower depth that's going to be deeper that's not going to impact farming operations or waste disposal or foundations or whatever urban use we happen to be be using so these first tile in the late 1800s and early 1900s were put in by hand uh, this was just brutal work uh, these soils were not drained obviously so you're going to be out there in wetness um, the soils are going to be wet they're going to stick to the spades and shovels the equipment you're using you're hand digging, you got to survey this so that the tile flow downhill to an outlet. So if there's a hill, you've got to compensate for that. You either dig a deeper ditch or go around it uh, to get that water to flow by gravity out of the field. The early tile that were put in by hand were clay tile. The water did not flow through the clay. The, they left a gap between them and the water would go through the tile, um, the gaps in the tile. Uh, today, and you'll see pieces of these, a lot of these were put in by hand and shallow, and the modern farm machinery's ripped up a bunch of these. You'll see pieces of tile all over laying on the surface. So now we put them in with uh, a much deeper, um, with larger equipment. Um, we use uh, lasers and GPS and elevation control so we can control the, the depth we're digging as we go uphill. We've got to dig deeper uh, in order for that trench or that tile the flow down down slope here's what the tile look like you've all messed with this before probably they're they're corrugated plastic now with slits uh, the water enters through the slits uh, the the tile reels hooked up to the trenching machine and it it digs the trench buries the the pipe at the same time then we backfill over the top of it and you don't know it's there some of these are put in in really uniform wet soils are put in on a grid every 30 feet every 50 feet every 100 feet um, most of our watershed does not have it done on a grid like this. Some of the new stuff they're putting in this way uh, as, as managers buy their own tiling machines. But uh, most of the tile, uh, unless you're in the flat, really flat level areas where they did grid tile it, they were what were called random drainage. And that's not really random. They're targeted. They only put the tile in the wet areas. Now here you have the areas in white would not have needed tile. They were well-drained or moderately well-drained. You still have to get that water to a stream somewhere. So the, the, the blue areas would be the poorly, somewhat poorly, and very poorly drained soils. And that's where the tile are. So many of you deal with urban issues now, and we have to do tile searches to locate all these. So we're not bringing that water uh, into foundations. Uh, when we do urban development, we can't, or conservation, we can't simply uh, crush or remove these tile because it has a negative impact on the economic livelihood of everybody up tile. So there are laws in Illinois that, that dictate uh, what happens when you destroy or somebody does not maintain a tile, what the rights of the people up tile are you. Many of these tile that were put in moved through two, three, four, five, six landowners before they reach stream. So um, you just can't simply crush the tile or, or uh, uh, remove them without negatively impacting somebody up tile. Okay, so the last thing I want to get to is the, is the agricultural nitrogen and the BMP part of this. So these tile drains, um, drain to some surface water body somewhere, uh, a creek, a stream, a river, a drainage ditch. Um, now, one thing I want to mention about drainage tile is water does not flow down into the tile. The water table, as the water table saturated zone rises, the water will move into the tile. So people incorrectly think that if you put a drainage tile in, it's going to intercept the water that's coming down. That's not true. It does in unsaturated conditions, the surface area of the soil is going to hold the water tighter than this giant macro pore. So the only way water can get into the tile is as the saturated zone comes up and then water will flow into, into the tile. So let's talk a little bit about nitrogen in the, in the watershed and the Corn Belt. 
Uh, these are the essential nutrients that all, all plants need. Uh, we're going to focus on nitrogen here, and there's two forms of nitrogen, nitrate and ammonium, and I want you to notice one's an anion and one's a cation. That's going to be huge. Uh, phosphorus is an environmental problem also. Potassium is not. Uh, nitrogen is the big one, though, uh, so we're going to focus on that one. It's more mobile. Uh, we've got more of it moving into surface water and groundwater, uh, and we put more of it on. So a little bit of background about soils in this part of the world. Um, organic matter and clay have what we call cation exchange capacity. So if we look down here at a clay or organic matter particle, it actually has a net negative charge. It's, it's, uh, you don't get a shock when you touch it, but it has a negative charge. So there are all these negatively charged sites, and what they'll do is they'll attract a cation. So let's say this is a big film of water around here. The ions that are dissolved in the water, the cations will be attracted to the clay and organic matter. The so the cations will be attracted, hence cation exchange capacity. The anions will be repelled. A negative will repel a negative. And the anions are going to move and potentially be contaminants. They're going to move with surface water and groundwater. Okay, if we look at uh, fertilizer applications, the nitrogen amount, the U.S. is on the left, the nitrogen amount just keeps going up and up and up and up, and that's where we're getting our high yields in corn is from increased uh, hybridization and, and the plant genetics people have done a good job. The, the soil managers have done a good job, and we're just pumping the nitrogen to it. Same thing with, with uh, turf industry, uh, golf courses, sod farms, suburban lawns, urban lawns, agricultural lawns. Uh, we pump the nitrogen in, 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 uh, into these grass plant systems. So let's uh, look at a couple things about the nitrogen cycle. Um, plants will take up ammonium, the cation, and they will take up nitrate, the anion. Now, there are transformations that nitrogen can go between those two forms and to some of these other forms. So one thing I, I, I like to point out to people is the, the atmosphere that we live in, that we breathe, 79% of it is nitrogen. So we literally live in an ocean of nitrogen, but it's N2. It's dinitrogen, and that bond to break the nitrogen apart from another nitrogen takes an extremely high amount of energy. So nitrogen is often the limiting factor in plant production systems, especially grass. So when people talk about prairie, it's not just grass. It's also the nitrogen-fixing legumes that make the prairie go. So in corn production and wheat production, it's the nitrogen that makes the system go. So we add a lot of nitrogen to corn production. Um, a lot of it's tied up in organic molecules in the soil, but it's slowly released and reincorporated and released. And the plants can take up, again, ammonium as a cation or nitrate as an anion. So the most common nitrogen fertilizer used in, 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 the, in the watershed in the region is anhydrous ammonia. There are other nitrogen fertilizers that are solids and liquids. Uh, anhydrous is, is, the, is typically the one of choice. It's dangerous to work with, but it's typically the most economical. It's about 82% concentrated. So if you haul 100 pounds of this material, you've got 82 pounds of nitrogen. Many of the other materials are 10% or 12% or 28%. You have to haul more, haul more material. Uh, the price of this, the way it's produced, is often cheaper. Um, we can apply it with really large implements. So anhydrous is the, the choice. There, there, are other, there are other types, but I'm gonna focus on the anhydrous. So it's a gas in the tank under pressure. And when it comes out of there at atmospheric pressure, uh, it, it grabs a hydrogen and becomes ammonium and it will bond to the soil. It's a cation. Now, <clears throat> In an ideal world, we would put all the nitrogen on when the plant needs it, right before the plant needs it. Then there is less time for it to leach or leak out of the soil um, and potentially get into groundwater or surface water. <coughs> Excuse me. So why do we put most of the fer nitrogen fertilizer on the fall? It has a lot to do with timing of operations. So if you're done harvesting in September in a really good year, but October or November in a typical year, you have weeks or months before the ground freezes where you can do some activities, incorporate fertilizers. So, <coughs> excuse me, what that does is in the spring when it's really wet, if it, let's say it takes you seven days to apply fertilizer, 
if you wait for the soil to dry out and then take seven days to apply fertilizer, you're going to plant seven days later, unless you have more machinery or hire more people for that interim time. But if you put it on in the fall and hope it stays there, now you can plant seven days or 10 days. You're not putting fertilizer on. Now, um, it would be nice, again, if we could put it on right before the crop needs it. The problem with putting it on during the growing season is once the corn reaches a critical height, we can't drive through it uh, with, with toolbars and put anhydrous on. We can try putting liquid on with uh, high boys and other types of equipment, but that nitrogen's not getting mixed into the soil. It's being laid on top. It's not as efficient. So the other part of this is if we have 5,000 acres of corn, and we're going to side dress, put our nitrogen on when the plant's growing. What happens if it rains for seven days and we can't get out in the field? Now our corn crop doesn't have enough nitrogen and we're going to have really low yields and not be profitable. So a lot of this stuff is put on in the fall. Now the drawback to this is if we have warm, wet winters, this nitrogen can change form and it can move into groundwater. So let's look at that. This box down here is the soil. So it's got the ammonium in it and it's got the nitrate. There is a naturally occurring process called nitrification. That's the conversion of NH4 to NO3 minus. And this happens in an oxygen rich environment. So above the water table. So every time we have ammonium, it is slowly naturally being converted to nitrate. Nitrate is not held by the soil. It will leach and move into groundwater or get into the drainage tile and then go into the river. Now this is a biological process. So, and a chemical process. So when we slow the, when we lower the temperatures, we slow the biology and the chemistry down. So when we get to about a 50 degree soil temperature, we're only 20% as efficient as if we're at a 78 degree soil temperature. So if we put nitrogen fertilizers on when it's warm, we're going to have a fast nitrification rate. It's going to get converted rapidly to nitrate. If we put it on when the soil temperatures are below 50, we're going to have a slow conversion. And once we get to about 40 degrees, the conversion is the biology is really going to shut down. So if we put this fertilizer on in the fall and we get a warm, wet winter, a lot of that nitrogen is going to be converted uh, to, amo to nitrate and it's going to be lost in the drainage tile. So what happens then is that tile water goes into surface water somewhere and ultimately the Gulf of Mexico. So we can get eutrophication. Um, that's the addition of, of nutrients, especially nitrogen and phosphorus. We get an algae growth. Uh, they feed on the nitrogen and phosphorus or out in the ocean. It's phytoplankton. Um, the algae eventually run out of the nitrogen and phosphorus food. They die. Then the decomposing organisms start to break them down. The decomposing organisms require oxygen. So they're going to strip the oxygen that's dissolved in the water. They're going to outcompete fish and other aquatic organisms from it. And we get what's called a hypoxic zone that doesn't have any dissolved oxygen in it. And it's because the nitrogen and phosphorus cause the algae or phytoplankton boom, and then they die and are decomposed. Um, so it's the decomposing organisms that are going to take the dissolved oxygen. So we have in uh, the Gulf of Mexico, the, the second largest hypoxic zone in the world. It's called the dead zone. Uh, it's naturally occurring, but it's gotten larger and it fluctuates with how warm and wet it is in the winter in the, in the corn belt and uh, how much nitrogen we lose from the, from the corn belt. So it's naturally occurring, but it's been enhanced by, by also urban activities, wastewater treatment plants, golf courses, suburban lawns. They also contribute nitrogen to, to this. So if we look around the world, there's hypoxic zones all over the place where rivers enter, enter coastal areas. So if we think about putting that nitrogen on, if we can keep it as NH4+, plus, it's going to stay in the soil, bound to the soil. The plant will take it up, and then we're going to make whatever the thousands of products we make out of corn uh, that nitrogen can end up in. If it's bound to the soil, it could be er eroded. And I'm not going to talk about erosion in this. I don't have enough time. But that nitrogen that is attached to the soil that gets eroded can cause the same problems that the nitrogen that becomes an anion is now going to leach and it's going to go out the tile water. Okay, so what are some management best management practices to combat this nitrogen movement in agricultural landscapes? Uh, again, if we think about the Mississippi watershed, we're up here in the Kish. 
So what we do impacts everybody downstream and ultimately the Gulf of Mexico. So if we think about the Corn Belt and the amount of nitrogen that's used and lost here, a lot of that is leaking out into the Gulf of Mexico. So one way to combat it is we can put in what are called bioreactors. So what we do is we have our regular tile drain, and then what we do is we put in what's called a bioreactor. It sounds really fancy, but it's just a big hole in the ground that we put carbon source or wood chips in. The, the wood chips act as a carbon source for the microbes. Um, so what will happen is this becomes anaerobic, and then we can denitrify. So earlier we went from NH4 plus to NO3 minus, that's nitrification. Now we're going to denitrify it. We're going to strip the oxygen off. So this, this water in here that's got carbon and microbes uh, doesn't have dissolved oxygen in it. So the microbes are going to start stripping oxygen off of the nitrogen. And eventually it's going to create N2 gas. And instead of nitrate going into the surface water, N2, which is a benign gas, which is already 79% of our atmosphere, it's going to go up. There's nothing harmful about this, nothing bad about this N2. It's going back where it came from. Now, here's the process. We take that nitrate and basically we just reduce it. We're going to strip the oxygens off and it's going to go off, volatilize as a gas back up into the atmosphere. This is a naturally occurring process, happens in wetlands, happens in rice fields. Uh, but we can use that nitrogen cycle science to remove some of that. Another thing we could do is we could have cover crops and we could scavenge that nitrogen. So for those not familiar with cover crops, uh, these are, I don't know why they call them crops, it should be cover plants. Uh, they're plants that are not going to be harvested. They're, they're really there to improve soil health and soil quality. And what's going to happen is they're going to reduce erosion. I'm going to focus on the nu nutrient scavenging in a second. It's going to provide carbon and energy for mic microbes. Uh, some can provide pollinator habitat, not all. Uh, it's, long term, it's going to improve soil quality and yields. Uh, there are some drawbacks to doing this, though, cost uh, and learning how to do this and, and the timing of, of doing it. I'll just, just mention tillage radish and cereal rye, cereal rye are two common ones used in, in our watershed. Uh, there are others that people are using, uh, the different plants in different climates and soil conditions. Okay, so why doesn't everybody do cover crops? Um, Okay, there's a cost of a seed. Remember, we're not going to harvest this. So there's going to be no immediate economic return from doing this. How are we going to apply seed? How are we going to apply uh, seed? Let's take a look at that. If we have standing corn, how are we going to plant a cover crop? Well, we got to use airplanes, helicopters, drones, uh, maybe a high boy somehow to spread the seed out here. So that's going to take time and money. The, it's not free to do this. Um, it takes time again to do this. We maybe we should be harvesting or doing tillage or something else. Now we got to turn somebody loose to do this. Uh, we live in kind of a marginal climate to do this uh, right now. Uh, if we harvest the corn in October, November, and now we have the sunlight hitting that cover crop, there's only a few days or weeks for that cover crop to grow, and then it's going to freeze and it's dead. Some people have tried this and they get poor kill of the cover crop. In the spring, the stuff regrows uh, or it interferes with their till their planting activities. Um, some people just are not aware of uh, and they haven't been educated on the benefits of it. Uh, some people own land versus renting land. Some people are good stewards, some are not. So some renters are good stewards. Some owners are good stewards. Some renters are lousy stewards. Some owners are lousy stewards. So how long is it going to take for me to get my investment back? And what you're going to see is improved soil quality. Now, a benefit to this is we're going to lower the nitrogen load going into the Mississippi River. Eventually, agriculture is going to get regulated on this. If, 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 if we keep putting too much nitrogen, and, and same with the wastewater treatment plants and golf courses and suburban lawns, um, eventually, there's going to be some sort of regulation. So let's improve our soils. Let's improve water quality. Um, so if we put those cover crops in, the scavenging, what that refers to is instead of that nitrogen that wasn't used by the crop that gets converted to nitrate leaking down into groundwater and into the tile, we have a plant that's growing now. It's going to actively take up nitrogen. So that nitrogen is going to cycle and stay in the soil and have less time uh, to move down into the, into the tile. 
So the last thing I want to mention here is strip tillage. And uh, there are many different definitions of conventional and conservation tillage. About 30% residue covers the cutoff for most agencies, what they use. So conventional systems are basically what we did farming in this country and watershed until the 1970s. And then we started conservation uh, practices. And, and a lot of those conservation tillage practices leave residue on the surface. No-till would be the extreme example of a conservation tillage system. We plant right into uh, last year's crop. Strip tillage, uh, I'll show you a couple of pictures of this. We plant, a, we strip till a two or three or four inch wide zone. And we add fertilizer to that strip. We do this in the fall. And then the next spring, we drive out in the exact same spot. And we plant in that strip. So we have to have really high-end guidance, GPS guidance. Uh, we can't be off by two or three inches. Um, so the last couple of years, we've gotten the technology to, to really allow people to, to do this. And what it's going to do is it's going to give us all the benefits of no-till and it's going to fight one of the problems that no-till has. So uh, this graph shows the residue cover on the x-axis and the amount of erosion that would occur on the y-axis. So if you have 100% residue cover, you're going to eliminate all the erosion, basically. If you have 30% residue cover, you're going to reduce 65% of the erosion. So it's not a linear relationship. So a little bit of residue controls a lot of erosion. Now, um, a, a no-till field, we would be planting into residue here, and we'd have minimum erosion. A, a conventional planting and tillage, we would be planting into this. We'd potentially have a lot of erosion on these slopes. And that eroded sediment can get into surface water uh, and other places we don't want it. So the main tillage implement that was used up until the 70s uh, was the moldboard plow, self-scouring steel moldboard plow. Um, the interesting thing is John Deere invented it, and I believe this past year in February, John Deere quit making moldboard plows. Uh, so it took them, what, 90, 87 years. Uh, they made they made moldboard plows, and, and they've gotten out of the moldboard plow business now. Um, so we don't see a lot of this around, but there's, there still is a fair amount. Uh, it has It's not gone away by any means. Most people now use either chisel plows or rippers, and that's going to leave some residue cover at the surface that's going to help protect for erosion. Now, the no-till planting, we plant directly into the existing crop uh, from the previous year. The disadvantage to this is our soils are going to heat up more slowly, and we're going to not have as vigorous germination and, and seedling growth, and we have potentially more fungus and disease problems. So on the really flat, black, wet soils, the no-till is not caught on because some people have had poor luck with it. Other people have had have other people have had great luck. Now the advantage is we're going to reduce erosion with this. Um, if we use the strip tillage, we get almost all the benefits of no-till, but we get a warmer soil that we can plant in. So this strip that was exposed in the fall and fertilizer was put in the sun is gonna shine on that. And this soil in the strip at planting is gonna be warmer than the soil underneath the residue cover here. So this takes a, a high level of management. You've got to switch your equipment over. Uh, even if we go to no-till, it's different equipment. There's a big learning curve. Um, the first three or four years, many no-till operators struggle. And after that, they, they get the system tweaked and they it, it works really well for them. So there are people in the watershed that have been no-tilling for 20 and 30 years and do a great job at it. There are other people who tried it, had bad luck for three years and abandoned it, went to went to back to some other method. Uh, so just to show you something about erosion here, we have mathematical equations that can calculate soil loss depending on the crop we're growing, how steep the slope is, how much rain we get what type of tillage we do. So I just want to show you pre-1970s, a typical field planted in our part of the world would have lost about 11 tons per acre of year of soil. If we take that exact same soil, exact same rainfall, and we switch to no-till, we reduce that to about three tons. So we, we eliminate two thirds of the erosion. And again, that eroded sediment can end up in surface water. Um, it lowers yield, so, soil quality, there's all kinds of things related to that. So if we look at two side-by-side -side soils that were uh, the same 150 years ago, this is from a forest preserve, uh, actually Genoa Woods in the, in the watershed. Um, this soil was never farmed. This soil was 20 feet away. 
and it has been farmed for 150 years. And I want you to notice the difference in color. The never cultivated soil has a lot more organic matter. And I want you to look at the structure, these aggregates. These are nice granules here. These are these big lumpy peds. The soil on the left is way more productive than the soil on the right. Now, how does this century of tillage impact uh, soil properties in the watershed? Okay, we have what are called soil aggregates, and that's just particles of soil stuck together with organic matter. The organic matter is going to hold them together. So this soil has a lot of organic matter. It's going to help hold the particles together. The same soil that's been farmed for 150 years, again, that used to look like that, is not going to hold the particles together, and uh, it's going to fall apart. So what's going to happen is when rainwater goes through those aggregates that stay together, that water is going to infiltrate and permeate. If these aggregates break apart, it's going to plug the pore, and the water will then run off instead of infiltrating. So here's uh, a little display. These are the same soils that were in the previous picture. Uh, these are the never cultivated soils. This is just a sieve. It's just a screen. And we take them. We put, say, 10 grams of soil in each one of these. These six were from the ag field. These six were from the, the, the never cultivated area. We put them in water for a couple of minutes and we gently wiggle the tray around. And what's gonna happen is the aggregates that are stable stay together, they stay on the sieve. And you don't see hardly any sediment underneath that sieve. The ag soils, about 60% of these aggregates fall apart. And what that means is water is, can no longer infiltrate, is now gonna run off. And if water runs off, we're gonna have erosion. And that uh, is not a good thing for groundwater recharge, for infiltration, for surface water quality, for soil quality and yields. So I just want to show you uh, one last piece of data and then a summary slide here. Um, if we looked at infiltration rates, these are four different sites. Uh, these were in the, the Fox River watershed, but very, very close. These were in, in Kane County. Um, here's a never cultivated area. Uh, here's the average infiltration rate in the never cultivated area. 13 inches or 13 centimeters per hour. So we can get five inches of rain and not have any runoff. If we go to the conventional till, there's seven columns here. The first three are zero, no water won't even go in, but we have 1.6. So what that means is if we get a half inch of rain in a conventionally tilled field, we now have runoff and erosion. Here's a no-till field. So this is an area that was never farmed. The, these three areas had been farmed conventionally. And then this field that says no-till in the 1980s was switched from conventional till to no-till. And you can see it rebounded from 1.6 centimeters per hour to about 10. So three inches of rain before there's any runoff and erosion. So we can also put buffer strips around waterways, drainage ways, and that will help capture any eroded sediment that gets out of there. So if we use conservation practices, tillage practices in the field, and we can put some buffers around things, we can keep all that sediment out of surface water. Now, the problem is we're taking land out of production. So economically, there's gotta be a return or reason for a land manager to do this. Um, and that's where a lot of the Department of Ag uh, cost sharing programs come in. All right, so how can we minimize the agricultural impact? More efficient use of nitrogen and phosphorus. I only talked about nitrogen here. Uh, apply only what the crop needs. If you can use multiple applications and as close to uh, when the plant needs it as possible, use a cover crop to scavenge some of that. Any way you can improve soil quality. Uh, if you increase the organic matter, you increase the cation exchange capacity and you hold more nutrients or more aggregates together. You allow more infiltration and less runoff and mount more groundwater recharge. You hold more nutrients. Uh, implement any kind of soil conservation practices that you can and putting uh, bioreactors in, in tile lines. Thank you. Uh, I got about five more hours, but 